Kia ora koutou. thank you for joining us tonight and welcome to Fertility New Zealand's webinar. My name is Kate and I'm the Support Coordinator for Fertility New Zealand. Thank you for our webinar sponsor, Merck, and for being able to bring this all together for us. Fertility New Zealand walks alongside all people facing fertility challenges. We do this by providing support, information and advocacy. You can contact us through our helpline, our regional and topic support groups, and connect with us on social media through Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. You can also join Fertility New Zealand as a member. Membership is free, and by joining us, you support the valuable work we do. On our website, we also have access to the Dandelion Newsletter. Um, we have over 30 fact sheets and a lot more information for you to see. And um, I hope that at the end of this, you might go and check out our new and updated website as well. So tonight, tonight's webinar is the ins and outs of public funding. Public funding can be hard to navigate. So here to break it down for us is Jeanette McKenzie. Jeanette is the Scientific Director at Fertility Plus in Auckland. She has worked in reproductive health for over 20 years and has worked in private and public clinics throughout her career. If you have any questions, please type them into the chat box. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. So we hope you enjoy the webinar tonight and over to you, Jeanette. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Hi everyone and welcome to the webinar about public funding in New Zealand. So, what we're going to talk about tonight is um, these topics here. So I'm going to do a little bit about the history of funding in New Zealand. I'm going to talk about the criteria for eligibility. I'm going to talk about the consultation process and scoring for public treatment. We'll just give a few scenarios and examples of how people might qualify for public treatment. And then if you do qualify for publicly funded treatment, just go through what is covered in the funding. And then the last section will be what you need to know. And that's just a little bit more about the ins and outs and details of the public funding. And then there's an opportunity for questions and answers at the end. So in New Zealand, as everybody knows, there is funding for public IVF treatment. And prior to 2005, there was only one cycle of IVF funded for treatment. And then at Fertility NZ, we're a really big advocate in getting the second round of public funding through. So these days we've got two packages of funding and I'll go through the packages in, in my presentation. So when the government agreed to fund two packages, that coincided with the introduction of single embryo transfer. So the idea around that was to make sure that everyone was having a really safe, healthy pregnancy with a singleton baby rather than multiple pregnancies, which were sometimes ending up in hospital um, causing more problems. So. That's how the second cycle came about. So what are the criteria for treatment? So women need to be aged less than 40 to be eligible for treatment. And that age is taken from the time of your referral for treatment. Your body mass index or your BMI needs to be less than 32. It also takes into account the length of time you've been trying to get pregnant. Takes into account if you've got children at home or already from the relationship or past relationship. There are residency requirements that need to be met. And you also must be a non-smoker and that includes vaping and you uh, cannot be using illicit drugs or have any um, documented alcohol abuse. So the public funding is really broken into two parts. 
The first part is your publicly funded consultation with a fertility specialist. So to get a public consultation with a fertility specialist, you need to have a referral from your GP. And as Kate said, I work in Auckland, so I'm really familiar with the Auckland and Northland uh, rules. And it's slightly different in the rest of the country, south of Auckland. But it's really important to know that if you have been trying for a, a year to have a baby, that your GP needs to refer you for a public consultation. And if that's if you live in the Auckland or Northland district, that's usually a referral to NRFS, which is the Northern Region Fertility Service. And in addition, you can be referred if you've been trying for a year, or if you already know there's a severe reason for your infertility, say if you have got no sperm and you're never going to get pregnant during that year, then your GP can actually refer you straight away. <clears throat> Another way to get referred in is you can self-refer for a privately funded consultation. So you can ring up any clinic that provides fertility treatment and book yourself in for a private consultation and those consultation prices will differ depending on what clinic you go to. And at that consultation, your doctor can also um, assess you for public funding. So as I said before, the consultation is a separate process to eligibility for treatment. So there's separate eligibility criteria for the consultation. So for example, in the Auckland region, the BMI for a consultation is less than 35, but for treatment it's 32. And that just gives more opportunity for more people to be able to see the specialist and discuss options and maybe talk about a weight loss program to become eligible. In Auckland and Northland, all the referrals are randomly allocated to one of three providers in Auckland. So there's Fertility Plus, Fertility Associates and Repromed. And if you have a public consultation, you'll be randomly allocated to one of those clinics. When you get to your clinic and you have your consultation, your fertility specialist will then calculate what's called a CPAC score. And if you gain 65 points or more on the CPAC, then you'll be eligible for public fertility treatment. And the points are calculated on various things like how long you've been trying and if you've got any children at home or what your cause of infertility is. Um, so here we are. Here's some different scenarios to talk about what sort of couples or people might be eligible for treatment. So the first one is it's a female male couple with severe infertility. So it could be you've had both your tubes removed or there's a very, very low sperm count or no sperm. There's something that's majorly affecting your chance of having a child. Um, this scenario, there's no children already and you've been trying for over a year. So as long as the other eligibility factors such as BMI, smoking and um, work visas and things, all of that criteria is met, then that couple would be eligible. Another example is a male-female couple but with unexplained infertility. And this is when the doctors are unable to, with a test, diagnose what is causing the infertility. Now, unfortunately, for this category, you don't become eligible for treatment until you've been trying for five years. But once you've been trying for five years and you're still under the age limit and BMI is there and everything, then you'd be eligible. Then the next scenario, we've got a female-female couple where the woman wanting to become pregnant has a biological cause of severe infertility. So that female-female couple would be eligible because there's a severe infertility. Maybe the woman only ovulates twice a year and, you know, 10 months out of the year, there's no opportunity to become pregnant using some donor sperm. 
And then we've got a single woman whose investigations are all normal and then hasn't become pregnant after 12 cycles of donor insemination. Now, of those 12 cycles, six of those cycles need to be in an RTAC, so that's a registered New Zealand IVF clinic. And if a single woman, or a same-sex couple actually, have done 12 cycles of donor insemination, of which six are at a clinic, then you may be eligible for public treatment after that as well. So that's just a few little examples of, of couples that would be eligible. So once you are eligible for public treatment, what is actually covered? So the consultation is not charged for, that's, that's publicly funded. And then your treatment is also fully funded, including all the drugs that you need to use for IVF. Sometimes there might be a drug that's not funded um, in rare circumstances, but um, your doctor would talk to you about that and the options and what the cost would be there. But generally, everything is covered for your IVF cycle. Now, it doesn't always have to be IVF for public fertility treatment. Sometimes um, you might have a choice of treatments. This is generally decided by the characteristics of your infertility. So, for example, if your ovarian reserve is very low, so maybe your AMH test is very, very low, then you would probably be offered donor egg treatment to use for your public funding. Um, maybe there's a good sperm sample and you have still got both your tubes and they're open, maybe IUI, which is intrauterine insemination, might be a choice of treatment for you. Um, but a lot of the time, the doctor would probably recommend IVF. Now, one thing that's not covered are all the add-ons. So these are all the extra things like pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy, um, HCG infusions, um, extra drugs, um, things like MZ. So all these extra added things that might happen in the laboratory or in the clinic, um, they are not funded and the clinic will tell you about what the cost of those are and give you the option to use those if they might be suitable for you. So a treatment package. So if you go down the route of doing IVF as your treatment, a package of care of IVF includes the egg collection and all the embryo replacements that come from all the frozen embryos in that cycle up to the point where you have a live birth. It includes storage of your frozen embryos created from that IVF cycle for the first 18 months. It includes ICSI, which is the sperm micro injection, if you need ICSI. And also if you need a surgical sperm retrieval, that is publicly funded. If you need donor eggs, that would be included. If you need donor sperm, that's included. And if you need a surrogate, that's included as well. <clears throat> if your treatment package results in a baby, then after having a baby, you have a reassessment of your eligibility before there's any more replacement of frozen embryos. And that'll depend on your, your situation, how many children you might have at that point and what your age is. The other option is IUI, as I mentioned before. And if you choose this option, you one package of care is four cycles of IUI using your male partner's sperm or donated sperm, if that's what you need. This treatment, um, if you have a baby, it's the same thing. After having a baby, you get reassessed for eligibility. And then if you're still eligible after having a baby, you can finish the number of cycles up, up to four cycles. 
if you're still eligible. So what you need to know, number of cycles. So if your first package of care, so whether or not that's four IUI cycles or your IVF plus all your frozen embryos, if you don't get pregnant from that whole package, then you will be assessed for eligibility for your second package of care. Now, sometimes cycles, you might be told at the clinic that it's a complete cycle or it's incomplete or it's cancelled. So if it's a cancelled cycle, it might be because the predicted dose of drugs didn't maybe work as well as expected. So there might be an opportunity to stop the cycle with those with that dose of drugs and then start again. So that would be what we call a cancelled cycle. Or an incomplete cycle would be if you took all your drugs, you had an egg collection, and then at some point it, the cycle didn't finish because maybe no eggs were collected at egg collection, maybe there was no fertilisation, maybe there was no embryo to transfer. And that would be what we call an incomplete cycle. And if it's cancelled or incomplete, usually you'll be able to start that whole cycle again. Um, and it wouldn't be counted as a complete cycle. So a cycle is counted as complete once you have an embryo transfer or embryos frozen, especially in a freeze all cycle. So criteria for the second package, um, most of the time it um, goes back to checking that you are still under the age of 40, still not smoking, still the correct BMI, um, checking all those things and also just assessing how things went in the first package. It might be that in the first package things didn't go as expected and maybe the recommendation for the second package might be something different. Now, while you're waiting to have your cycle, you might get pregnant, which would be fantastic. If you do, let your clinic know, and then what would happen is you would be taken off the wait list at that clinic once your pregnancy is well and truly confirmed and on the way. And then once you have your baby, you can be assessed again to be re-referred back from your GP if you still want to pursue more treatment. Now, once you get scored with that CPAC score and then you get allocated to one of the clinics, um, the waiting time for public treatment varies across the country. Um, so when you get enrolled in a particular clinic, they'll send you a letter to confirm that you're enrolled for public treatment with them and they will inform you of their current wait time in general, it's about 12 to 18 months, give or take, at the moment. And then when, you're, when you've waited your 12 to 18 months and you're ready for treatment, we still need all the eligibility criteria to be met. So you can't start smoking and put on weight. All those things still need to be met at that point. So public funding is free. However, if you're doing a treatment that ha has legal expenses or an ethics application to eCart, then you do need to pay for those. They are not funded. Um, so legal expenses, usually for surrogacy, don't need to have legal expenses anymore for donor embryo. But both surrogacy and donor embryo and some egg and sperm donations do need to go to ECART, the Ethics Committee. And there's a fee for doing those applications from the clinic and they'll be able to let you know what their um, prices are for that. Storage fees, I mentioned before, you can have embryo storage from a public cycle for 18 months. So that starts from when your embryos were frozen and you'll get your first invoice 18 months later, and then you will be charged usually an annual fee for storage from the clinic at that point. Counselling is included in your 
publicly funded package, usually at clinics. You can have access to two sessions of counselling and um, yeah, just reach out for that support wherever you can. Now, if you've got frozen embryos that you've created from a private IVF cycle before, while you're on the public wait list, there's a few rules to know about, um, especially if you're in Auckland and Northland. So if you're in Auckland and Northland and you've got embryos frozen from a private cycle, you need to either use them in private frozen cycles or you can transfer them to use as your first package of care for a publicly funded treatment. So say you've got maybe one or two private embryos and then your um, treatment months comes up for public funding, it might, it'll be worth talking to your doctor about what's the best way to go about using those embryos, but it might be just to have, if you've got one or two, maybe do some private FETs. And then once you've got no more embryos left, then you'll be able to have a publicly funded stimulated cycle. On the other hand, if you've got a large number of frozen embryos, say you're lucky enough you've got eight or nine or 10 in the freezer, like a really good number, it'd be really worth talking to your doctor and thinking about having all of those embryos transferred and to be your pu first public cycle because that's potentially eight or nine or 10 public transfers that you could have. Um, this rule is not for the um, rest of New Zealand. This is just in Auckland and Northland. So that was my presentation. I hope that was really um, informative for you. And I just wanted to open it up for questions and answers. And I can see there is one question already, what is considered severe infertility? So when you see the doctor, they've got a scoring sheet and there's different sort of sections and they score you as I think a zero, a three or a six and a zero is a no score, a three is a medium and six is what we would say severe. So for example, for male factor infertility, it would be having no sperm or a sperm count of less than a million, for example. Um, whereas say if there was a sperm count of maybe 10 million per mil, which is not normal, but it's not super, super low, then that would probably get the, um, the medium score. Um, another example of severe infertility would be that you have no tubes. So you are just not going to get pregnant. So you would get maximum points for, for that. Or you might have very severe endometriosis um, or you might not be ovulating at all. It's something that's really like drastically preventing you from getting pregnant. Okay, I'm just reading the question. Why is there no funding for male couples? My partner and I have spent $20,000 already and we haven't even got to the stage of making embryos. My sperm is too poor to be used as a donor, so I have to go through with ICSI, which is even more expensive again. We don't get funding for our egg donor or for IVF or for frozen embryo transfer to our surrogate. It all feels pretty one-sided. Yeah, I can't really answer um, why there's no funding for male couples. Um, what I can answer is the sperm is too poor to be a donor, but you need to do ICSI. So usually to be a sperm donor, we need the sperm to be even like way, way better than normal because it has to be frozen and thawed and we lose so, so much. Um, and I don't know how poor it is and why you have to do ICSI, but it, I'm, I'm, you probably need to talk to 
the scientists at your clinic to find out about that. Um, here's another question. If you don't succeed after your first round of treatment, how long is the wait time for reassessment? So there's not really a waiting list to do your second cycle. Um, I know um, in my experience at our clinic, if you're not successful in the, in the first round, then we assess pretty much um, straight away and book a new month for treatment. And that's um, usually within six months. But there's not another waiting list, like a second waiting list for that. Okay, this is another question. Is counselling sessions publicly funded for private treatment packages? No, if you're having private treatment, it means that you're not eligible for public treatment. And your second question, what's an FET? That's a frozen embryo transfer. Is the randomization of clinics equal or weighted based on the clinic size, so to receive faster treatment times? So in Auckland and Northland, the randomization is 60% um, to the public fertility service and then 20% to each of the private clinics. And they monitor the treatment times to make sure all the three clinics are, um, have similar waiting times for consultations and treatment. Here's another question. What happens if you rock up for egg retrieval and your BMI is literally just on or over by 0.1? I don't think the doctor will say anything to you if it's 0.1 over. I'm sure you'll be fine. And it's not routine to be getting out the scales routinely at your collection. If you don't get many eggs retrieved due to a low AMH and none of them make it to embryo stage, how many attempts can you make at egg retrieval under public funding? So it's not an unlimited ability to keep reattempting egg collection it'll get to a point where the doctor would probably say to you that you've tried this and it's not working um, we're unable to give any more public funding to you but you might be eligible to use your public funding for donor eggs instead so it's usually a couple of times and then if the same thing keeps happening again the doctor will be probably suggesting a different um, type of treatment. If we have a baby from the first cycle of care, are we eligible for a second page, package of care for a second baby, baby given we meet all the criteria? Now that's a good question and I didn't actually answer that. No, once you've had a baby from your first package of care, you are um, you're not eligible for um, any more public funding. Second round of PGD, is there a waiting list for this? It was explained to us that it is linked to specific PGD funding, so it could be a longer waiting than non-PGD treatment. Hang on, let me just work out this question. Is there a waiting list for a second round of PGD? Um, usually PGD is a longer waiting time. Um, but again, like I said, with the just standard IVF, there's no separate wait list for a second round of PGD. Once you get to the top of the list,
for PGD, you'll do your first cycle and then at the end of it be assessed for your second round and then you should be given a month for treatment in the not too distant future. But, um, yeah, there's, there's not a second waiting list. Next question, if two rounds of IVF fail, do you know how likely it is for couples to get pregnant with their privately funded IVF, e.g. the third round and fourth round? Well, it'll be depending on your age and your cause of infertility. Um, that's, yeah, I, I wouldn't want to put a, a figure on, on that, but um, yeah, it will depend on your specific circumstances. Please talk about the criteria if there's a miscarriage. Um, do you want to elaborate on that maybe? A miscarriage is not a live birth, so you would um, just keep keep going with your course of treatment. What is the process for an FET? Um, so an FET involves um, timing your cycle in uterus to the right time of when the embryo is frozen, and then the embryologist would thaw it and the doctor would transfer it back into the uterus at the right time, so usually on day five if it's a blastocyst. And the FET is also publicly funded if the embryos were created from your publicly funded IVF cycle. Okay, next question. If you're having public treatment, are you able to pay for embryo testing? Yes, if you mean PGTA, that is an add-on and you can pay for that separately on top of your public treatment. But if you're talking about PGTM or SR, which is genetic testing for a um, disease or translocation, you can't pay for that as an extra on a public IVF cycle. But if you mean for aneuploidy screening, then yes, you can, and that's an add-on. Is the waiting time so long because there's not enough funding to go around? I'm, I'm not sure why it's so long. There's a big demand and only so much capacity. We definitely need more funding in New Zealand. How much follow-up do you have with your fertility clinic once you become pregnant and how long do they follow up with you? Mm. So I can probably only speak for my clinic, but usually an, a pregnancy is tracked in the early stages and once the pregnancy is confirmed with sort of like a seven or eight week pregnancy scan and we can see everything's going well, you'd be discharged and asked to find your LMC and have your LMC look after you from that point. My doctor has told me I need to go through nine rounds of ovulation induction before qualifying for publicly funded treatment waitlist. If one of the rounds results in hyperstimulation and can't proceed, does this count as a round? Oh, I'm um, actually not sure if you'd have to ask your doctor about that. So it probably wouldn't count because there wouldn't be an opportunity. Oh, sorry, I think you missed my last question. So we can't get any funding as a male couple. My sperm results were given to me as functionally infertile. I've had to pay for storage as well, but the high rates of scazer damage mean a higher chance of failure to conceive, failure to thrive, failure to implant, and increased chance of miscarriage. I 
I think you should probably speak to your doctor about that because it's not a blanket rule that male couples can't have funding. If there's an issue, maybe there's an opportunity to explore that with your doctor. Right, next question. Do we pay anything for embryo transfer? If we have any frozen embryos, first cycle left for our second baby. If we have, if we have any frozen embryos from the first. Yeah, so if you have embryos left, if you have a baby and you've still got frozen embryos, you need to be assessed for to see if you're still eligible for public funding. So if you are eligible for public funding, then you won't be paying for your embryo transfer, but you might be paying for storage by that um, point because you might have passed the 18 month um, time. Um, or if you have had your baby and then you get assessed for eligibility and you might not be eligible anymore, maybe you've turned 40, so you're not eligible anymore, then yes, you would pay for your embryo transfers. Okay, next question. During implantation of a frozen embryo, what happens to the other egg after ovulation? Nothing. Nothing. It just um, gets absorbed into the body. Next question, if you become eligible for public funding in one region and then move to another region, does your public funding follow you? What is the process for getting reallocated to another clinic in a new region? Brilliant question. So yes, you can take your public funding to your new region. Talk to someone at your clinic that coordinates the public funding, usually maybe one of the administrators and tell them your situation and that you're moving and they will be able to get in touch with the public funding coordinator in your new region. We can arrange um, the notes to be transferred. And then when you get to your new region, it would be expected that they would um, acknowledge whereabouts on the wait list you were in your, in your old um, wait list. Okay, next question. If you miscarry within the first trimester of an embryo transfer from IVF, does that mean the IVF round was not successful and you continue with further transfers as part of your first round of IVF? Yes. Yep. Or is your first round of IVF considered complete as soon as you get a no? no. So, no, a positive pregnancy test is not a um, completed or a, a successful cycle. So it's a live birth. That's the point when it's counted as successful or not. Next question. Yeah, it's a shame. We spoke with our doctor and they said, because I'm not having surgery that would compromise my fertility, they said there isn't funding available for males, that was it. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Okay, next question, for FET, which is better, a natural or manufactured cycle? Well, it all depends on you and what your body does. If you've got a normal, regular period, a natural cycle might be the best for you, but if you don't like blood tests every day, maybe you don't want to do a natural cycle. A manufactured cycle is good for people that don't ovulate regularly. So that's really great to get the timing perfect for the embryo. Or maybe you've got some family event or some big thing on and you really need to time that transfer um, to be not on a certain day, then maybe a manufactured cycle is best for you. The pregnancy results are the same from natural or manufactured.
Thank you. Oh, thank you for hosting the panel tonight. I appreciate you answering my questions, quite frankly. You're welcome. I hope it's been very helpful to everyone. Hi Jeanette, thank you for thank you for tonight. It's we've had so many questions. It, yeah, we've been there's been lots going on. So thank you so much for your time tonight. Yeah, lots of good questions. Yeah. So tonight's webinar, the ins and outs of public funding. Um, public funding can be really hard to navigate, and um, so thank you so much for just shining the light on some of those really difficult questions um, um, that you know you were presented with tonight as well. So um, make sure you um, follow us and keep up to date with our webinar series. Our next webinar is all you need to know about genetic testing, and that is on Monday the 19th of June. So please um, tune in for that one. Thank you again for our webinar sponsor, Merck. And a big thank you to Jeanette for your time tonight and your presentation. I hope everyone joined tonight's webinar. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Jeanette. Thank you very much for your time. And I'm, we appreciate you being here. Thanks, Have a good everyone. night, everybody. Thank you.